All right. I've got a very special discussion lined up for you today on Over the Horizon. We're talking biomechanics and biomimicry in robotics and specifically the Tesla Optimus Gen 3 robotic hand. Let me bring in now my guest for today, Dr. Jitendra Ayer. He's a consultant, aesthetic, plastic and reconstructive surgeon. He's joining us from Bangalore in India. This is the first time on the podcast. Great to have him. And of course, Dr. Scott Walter mechanical and aerospace engineer and two-time founder of robotics companies. He's the internet's go-to expert, engineering expert on humanoid bots. Welcome, gentlemen. It's great to have you on Over the Horizon. Same here. Hello, Dr. Iyer. And thank Royden, I, I want to thank you for, for bringing uh, Dr. Iyer on because, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on YouTube. <laughs> and so it's kind of nice to actually get someone that will be able to tell us what's really going on in the human anatomy as opposed to what engineers have done. So at some point, you're just gonna have to give me a liberty to go through the history of the evolution of the Tesla hand and how we yeah. got to where we are. So we kind of understand the mindset going on in the engineers, and then we can have an actual physician kind of go in and straighten us out on what, what kind of biomimicry is actually being done faithfully and what is more or less like, uh, the engineers are just giving it their best effort based on sort of their limited knowledge of how human anatomy actually works. This is the video of uh, the hand, the Tesla Gen 3 hand. Uh, so this is this was shared on LinkedIn uh, by uh, James Voss. He's um, part, he's the an engineer with the robotic systems team at Tesla, and he shared this video on his LinkedIn feed. So take it away, Scott. Yeah, well, um, I didn't have quite that good of you at, at the We Tesla uh, or the, the We Robot event at Tesla. This was in like the VIP area and you could see it from the distance. And when I first saw it, I just thought, oh, it's a Halloween decoration because they were kind of near these other so almost like haunted mansion things. And I didn't think much about it. And then everyone was, was saying that it's definitely the hand. And it was later on when I got a chance to look at some of the videos and up closer that I could confirm that's like, oh, it definitely is. Plus everyone from the Tesla team came out and said, yes, it is the alleged 22 degree of freedom hand. But before we talk about the 22 degree of freedom hand, we want to talk about the original hand, which was the 11 degree of freedom hand, how they count those degrees of freedom, how they kind of, you know, got there in the, in the decision making process. So the first place to start is, I think, Walter Isaacson's book about Elon Musk. And there's a couple of chapters in there about the Optimus project. And it was a little over three years ago, um, I think, you know, August 2021, where he had the, the AI day one where the Tesla bot project was announced. And everyone remembers the, the, the dancing Tesla bot that was actually just a person in the suit. And there was like three PowerPoint slides. And at that point, everyone assumed that the project was already mature and kind of going along and a lot of thought had gone into it. And it turns out from Isaacson's book, it was like, it started the next day. <laughs> so it gets kind of announced and suddenly there's like an all hands meeting. Anyone that's interested in, in trying to build a robot please attend this meeting. And they all kind of came in. So they were just engineers from all over Tesla that knew things about your know, battery management system, how FSD computer works. Like, There was not a biomechanic in there. There may have been some people that were roboticists in the sense that they were probably using the robots that were on the shop floor. But it was one of these things they put together and then they started to thinking, well, how are we going to go about this thing? And there's a really interesting description of like when they're examining the hand. So they're, they're trying to, to make the decision. You know, the first argument is like, well, how many fingers do we really need to have? Does the robot really need to have five fingers? Can we get by with three or two? And if you're an engineer, especially a robotics engineer that's worked in the shop floor, you're used to having these grippers, which are, quote, two-finger grippers, okay? <laughs> Basically two paddles and not really fingers. And then sometimes they have uh, like a three-finger gripper that's good for picking up like a cylinder and stuff like that. So, you know, that's kind of the mindset is like, what's, you know, the minimum number of parts, how we can get these things to do. That's not biomimicry. So they're starting to, to, to look at that and they finally say, I, I guess we've got to go with five fingers, but they still have this mantra of, you know, the best part is no part. What can we do to kind of minimize the whole thing and how are we going to a actuate it? And so one of the first decisions they make is they, they decide to remove one of the phalanges or what most people might say, one of the knuckles, they basically take the distal and medial phalanges and they fuse them together and give it like that little arch that's there. And they take the proximal phalange and they make it a little bit longer. So they drop one of those from each of the fingers. The other things they decide is like the only motion that's important is this motion, what we would usually call flexion and extension, or most people would call grabbing, 
<laughs> grasping, something like that. And then worry about the fingers being able to move out this way. So you only had one degree of freedom down here on, you know, really where your knuckles are. I think this is called um, the MC, uh, MCP joint or something like that. It, it's a mouthful. You know, Dr. Iyer, I think you, you probably know exactly <laughs> how to pronounce that. So they, um, so they have that. And the thumb, they decided, would actually have two degrees of freedom down there and only expose. You know, we know there's like another knuckle buried down here, but most people think right. that thumb only has two knuckles that are on there. And from that, they get a count of 11 degrees of freedom that can move, but most of them are followers. And as far as the actuation goes, they um, have a, a steel cable or tendon in there that's attached to a little motor that spools it in there. And they have one in each direction. So for each finger here, they have four there and for the thumb too. So a total of six actuators all in the motor. Now I can share a slide that kind of shows that. To, so yep. we, we kind of an idea of, of the basis of where everything is coming from. It's biologically inspired. And right. they, they did say they are steel cables in there um, because for both strength and flexibility. Uh, and the motors that they were using, they're saying they're non-back drivable, which means when it gets locked in a position, it's really kind of hard to move it out. But we get an idea from this image and the, um, the, next, whoop, the next one after it that this is sort of the design they came up with, with the actuators and everything in there. And you can see the wrist design down here that is like not quite integrated into the hand, but pretty close and not part of the 11 degrees of freedom that they're talking about. So, um, so that's what it looks like. And then of course they, and these, these are the actual motors that they use. So six actuators, 11 degrees of freedom, total non-back drivable, and it's able to take up to, to 20 pounds um, of lift capability, grasping capability. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a fuzzy um, view of the Gen 2 version of it. So they they modified the hand a little bit, but it was still 11 degrees of freedom. We can see the actuators out here that are used to get the wrist to move back and forth. You can see how big and bulky they are. It's, it's an interesting uh, parallel kinematic mechanism. Right. Uh, and then this here is probably a, a little bit of better close-up of exactly how the fingers are. So you get an idea of the compromises they made from the way of true human hand works to what they were, the simplification they were doing. Right. Um, now, my belief is if you look right here, these little kind of gold color things are actually little torsion springs. So this is what allows the finger to open back up when you take the, um, uh, the tension off of, of the, the tendon to allow it to pop open. So these are the kind of compromises the way they did it. What this means, it's got a, a lot of gripping force, but as far as opening up, it you know it just has like enough to be able to kind of open it up, but it wouldn't really be able to resist anything very much. So okay. that's kind of the background of that. Before before we do that, mm -hmm. I want to get a sense from Dr. Jitender. You've watched Scott take us through the evolution process. Give me your first thoughts um, from the perspective of uh, of a surgeon who's who deals day in and day out with you know, reconstructive surgery, it's specifically focusing on the hand because that's your area of speciality. Do you feel the um, evolutionary process of this design uh, and the engineering aspects of it are moving closer and closer to replicating or biomimicry, as we say, the human hand? Because we're talking about deploying these robots um, in the real world, a real world that's built for human interaction and manipulation primarily through the human hands. What I feel is it's getting closer and closer to the to the real one. But sensation is one thing, which means uh, feedback, the biofeedback which is there, which may not be there, but it will come up with the uh, with with uh, with uh, improvement in technology. There'll be biofeedback which will be coming back. But it is becoming better and better, and uh, it will be more versatile with time to come. Yeah. And, right. and uh, on, on that point, that was like one of those early discussions that they had when, you know, the engineers are sitting there and they're trying to figure out, oh, how does the human hand work and, it, and everything else? And at some point they, they point out, they go, oh, crap, you know, how, how are we going to measure the forces and stuff like that? And they were, they were trying to think of it. Like, oh, we're going to have to put sensors in it. And then, of course, everything just got really complicated. And I think it was uh, Franz or one of them that kind of like pulled them back. So wait a minute, let's simplify it. And eventually they decided to use just force feedback. In other words, they were going to measure the tension in the tendons and from that kind of infer the amounts was there. And then in the Gen 2 version, 
mm-hmm. based on the experience I had with the Gen 1, it's like, ah, we need a little bit of tactile uh, sensory ship. So they did put some sensors on the tips to sort of help them in it. Mm-hmm. But that's still an active area of discussion by other humanoid bot companies that, that started out putting the sensors in there and found out, you know what, we don't need them. We think we're going to take them out. So there's going to be this back and forth on how much, you're right, the, the biosensory is going to be a bit of a trick. The other thing is actually what the range of motion is. You know, how much motion do you really right. need to have a fully functioning hand? Okay, uh, Dr. Ayer, do you, do you feel sensors are essential for, sensors? for let's sensors. say, everyday general jobs, the, the dull, dirty, dreary uh, jobs that robots would perhaps be deployed in first in place of humans? If there's a, a means force range, which is a spray set that may prevent you or it will reduce the dependence on the force feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, determined that there's about 20 grams, 40 grams of power or uh, 40, uh, five newtons or two newtons of power, whatever, whatever you desire, if that is there, then you can determine that this activity requires this much of power, not more than that. If you have to hold a cup, that much of power only is required. If, if you have to hold a printer or a laptop or a bowl of a thing or a weight which you are going to lift, you will know, you will determine how much of weight it, it is there. And accordingly, you can manipulate a little bit and you can preset it before itself. Yes. Instead, yeah. of, uh, instead of doing it every time uh, over and over again, you have a predetermined level and then you, uh, you do it accordingly. That yeah. will help yeah. in reducing the biofeedback requirement yeah and and, and part of it so you know the example is i've got two water bottles here one which is full one one which is empty when i see that it's empty i already kind of know oh it's going to be really easy to pick up so i know that ahead of time of of what my action could be if i see it's full i know oh you're going to have to to grasp a little bit harder or it's going to be a little bit much force the other thing is that the vision system is an incredible sensory organ and that you almost don't need the tactile you don't need the force feedback because you can see are, are the fingers doing what they're supposed to? So you, and this is, it turns out having talked with some of these companies, they were finding out they can do more with the vision than they thought they could get away with. Now, the one thing they can't do is they can't count change in my pocket. Okay. When I, when I can't see it, or when I have to reach around the back of my computer to stick that USB port in there, you know, a lot of times you need that little sensory touch to do those kind of things. But those are like, the, you know, th- those are the 90%, 95th percentile use cases. When we're talking about 80% of the time, you probably don't have to do that. And if you're trying to economize and bring the cost down, you can get away with it. But yeah, eventually, it's nice to have the tactile sensors. You will ultimately require sensors if you want to do a delicate job. If it's mm-hmm. a gross right. job, you may not require it. But for a delicate job, yes, it requires. If you want to shake a hand, you don't know how much of pressure you're going to put. You may crush the other person's hand. Well, let's put it this way. If you want to be a surgeon, <laughs> you, want, you want to have the delicate touch. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, or the other analogy is like, if you're a watchmaker and you're trying to like, you know, re- replace the watch batteries or something like that, it's nice to have that delicate touch, but there's other operations that are very, very simple that we can get away without. That's true. For activities which don't require too much of uh, I mean, tactile sensation, you don't really require the feedback. But yeah. for uh, delicate work and which requires more of precision work or which requires a dynamic change in activity there you require biofeedback okay okay mm-hmm. now um it would be interesting to, to now move on to the evolution yeah that, that they decided to go from 11 to 22 and i'm having a hard time counting the 22 so you might be able to help me out here and the other thing to point out is again there's almost like confirmation that they didn't even have a biomechanist involved in this whole thing. And the way I know that is that when they did the presentation of everything of the joints and you looked at the movement of the shoulders and you looked at the movement of the wrist, they talked about shoulder roll, pitch, and yaw. And then they talked about the wrist, you know, roll, pitch, and yaw as well. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If that was a biomechanist, (laughs) they would have been talking about flexion, abduction, adduction, and all that on everything else. So the terminology is like straight out of the roboticist handbook is not coming from what a biomechanist would do. And part of it is that maybe some people get a bit confused with that. But in the end, to me, that was a telltale sign. It's like, 
there was no biomechanist running this project. If he was, that would have been the terminology they would have been using throughout. So again, it comes sort of like from engineers being inspired by looking at it and doing what engineers like to do sometimes is that we reverse engineer something, even if we can't look inside it. We, we try to guess, how was it work? How would we get that to work? And then we work on it. I guarantee you, probably no one there had like a class in anatomy to, to really know what was going on. They've heard of tendons. They know a little bit about that. They remember from high school and have gone ahead and done it. And we can now see what they're doing in the next one. So I will continue. I think I'm still sharing here and um, I have the next screen I'd like to go uh, bring up here right now. Okay. So this is from a video taken by Dirty Tesla. Oops. Um, and he was in the VIP area and was able to get a much higher quality video than the other ones we've seen. And from this, I've tried to figure out where all the degrees of freedom are. Now, when the first time we heard about this, I think it was like last May or something like that, we're just out of the blue in a reply to someone else just talking about how the robots are going to be you know, rather amazing uh, in what they're going to do. Elon just said, oh, and the new Optimus 22 degree freedom hand is just going to be awesome. And like everyone was just like, whoa, wait a minute, where'd that come from? And he must have just come from a meeting and was like so excited about it. You know, he just couldn't contain himself and had to talk about it. And then there was some other discussion. And then he said, oh, and by the way, we're moving all the actuators into the forearm. So the current design is that everywhere in the palm is where the actuators are. Now they're all going down here somewhere in the forearm, which we have to figure out. So that means this is kind of empty up here. And he indicated that it would be able to play the piano and was asked whether it would be able to do the Vulcan salute, you know, moving the fingers out like that, and was said, oh, it won't be able to do that because it's kind of an unnecessary thing. So, so while I was counting degrees of freedom, I was also trying to count the number of actuators. So there's a couple of things you can do mechanically is that you could link these together that you could just have one actuator that makes the finger go whoop like that and then close up like this. And you could have it spring loaded to kind of bring it back. So it's like one actuator. So I was thinking, oh, they're going from six actuators, maybe to seven. And then if, depending on what other things are going to do, maybe a little bit more. But I was settling that they're kind of have somewhere between seven and 10, probably resting more at seven based on that. You look at that image, it's doing the Vulcan salute, okay? <laughs> so that's pretty clear something else. The thing you can start counting all of the tendons that are down there. And we're having a hard time counting the tendons because they're somewhere around there. Most people have counted at least 16 tendons, but I don't think they're seeing the ones from behind. So I'm guesstimating that they might actually have 20 in there, and I'll give you my reasons why in a second. But I always assumed when they said 22 degrees of freedom that they were going to add an extra knuckle to each finger. So you're going to go from basically two degrees of freedom on the fingers so now you had three plus an abduction, that's four for each finger. The thumb would get the extra knuckle too and go from three to four. So four times five, that gives you 20 degrees of freedom. Where's the other two coming from? Ah, I assumed it's coming from the wrist because the, there are some biomechanists who will include the wrist in the degree of freedom count of the hand. Some do, some don't. That's the 11 doff hand does not include it, but as assuming since they're moving the actuators down here, they're considering the wrist to be part of the hand and that got me to 22. That was my assumption of how they're doing it. And then this hand comes out and I'm like, well, wait a minute. They've got this crease right along here on the pinky. And I don't know what you would call that, Dr. Iyer, but it, it seems like there's a, a, an extra degree of freedom. And you throw that one in there and I get to 23. <laughs> and so I'm at a loss. And I need to help me out there. It's like, first, what do you call that? And... Is, do you think there's some other movement in here that would be a natural movement that we are missing that would mean excluding the wrist? Another, another, take the wrist out of it. So this would get you down to 21. That means there's another degree of freedom in there I'm missing. Yes. If you see the hand, uh, the first and second race of this hand, they are fixed race. They're called fixed race, where there's no movement between the metacarpals. Okay. But when you see the third and fourth ray, I means fourth and fifth ray, they are mobile. They can move. They can mm -hmm. move separately. While these are fixed, they can move forward. Okay, that's like cupping of the hand. That is what is right. Um, right. they are trying to mimic, like cupping okay. of the hand. So that's 
So these are they help in power grip also. When you are doing a power grip, this move this movement also helps, and it also yes. helps in stopping the hand. So that's that's what the, that they may be trying to mimic from this case. Right. Right. So so that crease there, and I think that's to, to help with what I think is called distal opposition, where you can touch your fingertips. And a lot of times to get the pinky, you kind of want the pinky to fold over. You get that. So I'm counting that in there, but I'm looking at the thumb. I say, okay, we know we, we can see this big crease along the thumb. Some people like jokes like, oh, that's the lifeline. So now the palmistries will, you know, they'll be able to come in and kind of look at it and <laughs> well, yes. to read the fortune, right? So you've got this thing that moves. That was always there. And I guess that's the abduction. And then you have the flexion movement here. And I still get four there. And I was like, is there a fifth one hidden in there that we're not seeing from the mechanics that would tell us that if we have five here plus the pinky, okay, I can get to 22, take the wrist out. So that means they're not counting the wrist like they never did count the wrist, though some people may or may not put it in there. And that could be where my math is wrong. And again, if we go back to that image, uh, if you can bring that up, Royden, let's, let's look at the thumb and see if we can figure it out. And there is a video we can go through to look at the movement of the thumb, but I'm only seeing four degrees of freedom there. I'm, but I don't have the surgeon's eye <laughs> to be able to tell. Um, is there anything obvious in that? That looks like I'm missing. Yeah. The thumb actually has got uh, this movement. One is the abduction. Take care. One is adduction. Adduction is this one. Right. Okay. And then in the, you have what uh, means opposition. Right. Opposition. So there are different muscles for it. One is a adductor here. There's an abductor here. And an oppos uh, opponents also is there. So these are three muscles which are there, which move the thumb uh, across in the 3D plane. So to mimic the 3D, 3D movement of the thumb, you require more of motion around. If you really want to mimic the thumb. Because thumb is the one versatile thing which occupies a lot of the hand function in the brain. Yes. So yes. Uh, thumb has got a big representation in the brain. Thumb, if without the thumb, the hand, more more than 50% of the hand function is lost. Take it. So uh, the thumb is important because thumb performs a lot of activities, which is mostly because it is able to oppose the finger. It's going to give an opposing post for all the fingers. So, and its position determines whether you're able to pick up a small object or you're able to hold a large object in your hand. So mm -hmm. uh, thumb per se, uh, the movements are more than all the fingers. Right. The mm -hmm. fingers, individual fingers have got less movement. The, they, the individual fingers have got abduction, adduction, flexion, extension. This is one. Yes. Thing. This has got flexion, extension, abduction, opposition. So there are a lot, a lot more and uh, again okay. the thumb has got a separate muscles it's a separate group of muscles for the thumb to work like the little finger the little finger also has got a separate group of muscles but the thumb has got more individual specialized muscles so uh, which help it move and do the function of, of the hand okay so, okay. so let's let's take a look at this video here from dirty tesla which shows a little bit more and maybe we, we can see that because I'm clearly seeing, you know, that at some point we're going to see the abduction, adduction there, which is a pretty obvious um, link right in there. And then we can see the flexion kind of going on the thumb. Oops, let me see. I think I have to reset this thing. Let's try this again. Um, okay, so we can see that. What I'm not seeing is where that third motion might be in there. And it might be that it's a very subtle movement. And I'm trying to find the mechanism that does that. Uh, I'm almost looking at does it, the thumb's not going to twist about itself. I, I tried doing that with my own thumb. It's like, oh, that hurts. Uh, I'm trying to figure out. But like you say, there might be that other opposition movement. And I can't quite see where the mechanics are for that. It, it might just be well hidden inside of there. See, so normally the thumb faces away. This is how it, it faces. It doesn't face the finger uh, fingers. You know? So it has to rotate. This thumb has to rotate into position to oppose to the thumb, oppose yes. the other fingers. Okay, now. That rotation may be the other movement in which, we, which they may be trying to mimic. In the okay. Now, so, maybe so, a, uh, this thing which will rotate this to uh, meet the fingers. But, 
instead of being like this normally it's like this but when it's trying to meet the fingers it has to rotate back and meet the fingers so that's what it, it um, they may be have a, they may have a mechanism in which the thumb itself is rotated here itself instead of rotating across the motion it may rotate it here itself so when it just abducts and the uh, thumb is already rotated before before it meets the fingers okay Royden, can you share this right now? I'm going to try to go through a, a small clip here. Okay, see, so this is, this is where we see the abduction going on there. It tries to do a little bit of opposition over here at some point. Um, but came, and then Scott, if you see the mm -hmm. thumb, the normal resting position of thumb is different in, in, this, in this hand. It is yes. already like this. It's already like this. Okay. It's not like this. It is already like this. So it rotates and it comes in position directly. It is not. It's already rotated. So they are. Uh, they are not using that. Separate this thing. Normally our hand is like this. Finger is like this. Okay. okay. So when it's rotating, it moves here. Okay. But in the in the pro, uh, robotic hand which you have shown, the thumb is already rotated like this. It is already facing like this. All right. Okay. It's yeah. So, they, they, so they, they may have that rotation in there hmm. because they're not faithfully doing all of the, the accurate degrees of freedom. It, it may be that this, quote, opposition one is not quite the same as a human opposition. And as a result, to get the orientation, they actually have to twist the thumb. Hmm. Even though, So even though I can't do that, mechanically, there's no reason why they couldn't decide to do that. To, like you say, to get all three orientations, you need to get out of the thumb. Hmm. So that might be how they've hidden it in there. Um, now, as, as far as like uh, going through and, and looking how the tendons and everything work here, um, my belief is, and we can see up in here, and I've got sort of another image that points that out, that we can see how the tendons are running through the hand. And I believe right, right there, these are the tendons that do the flexion. And I believe there's a second tendon to do extension. Now, do we have that in the human hand? I assume we might have two tendons running through there to help open up. Right, good. Be because as everyone might know, strings, which basically is what a tendon is, are really bad in compression. Here, you pull on them, they're good. But when you try to push them, they're not very good. So if you try to push the tendon the back way, it's not going to give you a whole lot of help in opening the finger up. You need something else. And we can see in this video as it comes around here, that um, around here, we can begin to see the tendons that are on the top part of the finger, mm -hmm. which are, I think, I call them the extension tendons. I'm not sure what you would actually call it, but the, these are the ones that are used for extension. That means if you've got a, a bottom tendon for flexion and one for extension, the tendons have to end somewhere. And that means they have to end in an actuator. So for what is usually like considered one degree of freedom, you've got two actuators on there to push and well, basically to pull. One pulls and the other one releases to allow the other one to go up and down and they're able to do the two like that. So two actuators just to do this. And then if we look really close, and I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll bring up like the, uh, the image that I have uh, of this that's maybe a little bit better. So, yeah, we can see these in here. We can see those tendons there for flexion. We see what are these two over here, which I think causes the abduction. So, again, there's one that's going to pull down that will do the abduction, and one will pull the other way to give you the abduction to go back. So they've decided no springs uh, to go back. And part of, I think, the reason is, is that usually you want the fingers to go back to a neutral position. And when your fingers go up, you can get away with a spring because you can say fingers all the way up. This is your neutral position. But if sort of in the middle is your neutral position, then the, the springs are going to have to sort of force everything over beyond where you want. So if you want that to be a neutral position, you're going to have to have what Elon's referred to as like these puppet strings that you kind of pull both ways to get your finger into the position. So that's what I'm seeing here, which means each finger has got four actuators on it. We have five fingers out there. So that's at least 20 actuators. Plus, if you've got another degree of freedom here in the thumb, that's going to be 21. And then 
we also have the fact that the pinky is able to come around. That's probably 22. So they probably have 22 degrees of freedom and 22 actuators. Does that, does that sound about right? Is that how the human anatomy actually works to be able to make the fingers go back and forth? Basically, if you, if you see the hand, this finger, it has got four for this thing. There are two tendons for flexion. One is for two. flexing the. Uh, okay. There are two tendons for only flexion of the finger. Wow. Okay. 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 There is one tendon for extending the finger, but that is again supported by two muscles. One is abductor, one is adductor. Mm -hmm. Like this. Okay. So this movement is also provided by two muscles. Okay. Abductors and adductors, they work like this. Two mm -hmm. for flexion. One flexes at the PIP joint and one flexes at the DIP joint. Flexor distal uh, superficialis and profundus. There are two tendons for flexion and one is for extension. And for the index finger, there are again two tendons, exercise indices and exercise distorum. Same thing for the little finger. There's an exercise uh, digital minimi and exercise distorum. There are two tendons for the little finger, but all the middle fingers, all the these two have only one tendon for extension. And then you have got abductors, abductors and adductors, which help in flexion of the MCP joint. This MCP mm -hmm. joint only, yep. this helps in flexion, abductors and adductors, and they help in extending the IP joint. IP joint is this joint, these joints, these joints yes. are extended. So that's mm -hmm. how a normal uh, means the hand anatomy works like that. Take, so they have, if you see one, two, three, four, five, at least five muscles for per finger. Okay, that's interesting. Now, um, that might explain why we're really good in gripping because we've got two tendons helping with the grip, but not so good with being able to go in opposition because we have only one for it. In their case, they're not worried about that. They've just got not one tendon will, will probably suffice for being able to do that and also for doing the opening. Now, this is another thing that I, I've kind of surmised we check out is that in the 11 doff hand, when you pulled on that single tendon, you only have one tendon in there, you got this motion. You had no choice, but that's that motion. The only way the fingers would kind of come down straight is if there was an opposing force that kind of kept the fingers from going around. But okay. the main thing is that you've got like a little spring mechanism there and you pull on it, that's it. That's the only thing you can do with 11 off hand. Now that they have the other tendon up there for the extension, they can play with the tension on both of them. And as they start to pull on, on the, the flexure, as it comes down with a little bit up there, you can make sure you can get that straight motion now. Uh, on there. So I surmise you can do that. And I suspect the reason is because you've got two tendons without it. That's what you're going to have. So that means they have a bit more biomimicry as far as the motion, not exactly the same because now I just learned we've got five tendons. Okay. That's what we wanted to have on here. Um, they're, they're doing it with four. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to know is whether they are able to keep the fingers straight and flex it like this. I, 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 I assume a mechanic, I, I think because mechanically I you can. Yeah. Because I saw only like this flexion. Flexion was like this, like this, like this. You know? So if you exactly. want to hold an, if you want to hold an object, which is a bigger size object, then you require this to flex first and then flex this. Yes. If this flexes like this, it pushes away the object. Supposing I'm holding a mic, uh, my, this thing. Supposing I want to hold this. Think, you know? If my hand ah. flexes like this, if I'm if my hand flexes before it, I can't hold it. So it has to flex like this. Then I hold it. Then I hold it. Okay, Roy, that is an excellent point. That is a super excellent point. Um, that Absolutely. I had never really occurred to that because we always just think it's just gonna the hand's just gonna curl around the way. But you're right. If we come down like this, this might explain. The, there was like a the, uh, a video of them showing handing out the snacks, and yeah. at one point. Optimus accidentally grabbed two snack bags and it could have been, it was going for one, but it ended up getting the other ones caught in there because it's motion is like this, as opposed to being able to kind of come okay. down that way to be able to do the grabbing. Um, and that, that was like an, another Optimus video, but this, the, the same, th that's an excellent point, Dr. I, I'm glad you brought it because I'm, I'm pretty sure mechanically they, they can do that because if you just play with the tension, 
on that upper one, you can probably keep it from coming down and then allow it to go in. So, all right. I, we, we now see a real practical use for that. I mean, I was just looking and say, well, I can do this with my hand. Why can't Optimus? And it's just like, well, just because we can do it doesn't mean it's practical in any way. Death nailed the practicality of why you want to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I have a question here, Dr. Ayer. So when you look at the musculoskeletal uh, structure, you see antagonistic pairs of, of muscles along with tendons that affect movement. Got it. How, what is your assessment and what is your impression of the system that um, the Tesla Optimus uh, engineers have devised to affect movement? Because you're just seeing tension uh, through these tendons. You're not seeing the accompanying muscle or antagonistic uh, muscle systems at play here. So is that something that perhaps is, evolu is an evolutionary step that can be skipped effectively and you don't need it? Ultimately, it means at, at some point you will start requiring to have antagonistic movements. Mm -hmm. Antagonistic movements will require one should relax and one should get tensed. That yeah. should happen if you want to balance the hand. If you don't balance it, then the movements will become awkward. Because uh, if you want to flex, it, it may flex. If, if there's no opposition, it flex with, without opposition and flex very fast. If you have opposition, then you can do a controlled closure. Yeah. And right. uh, actually, Royden, I think if you go back to my, this, the screen share right now for a second, mm -hmm. we can go ahead and see that uh, in, in this video, what's going on. So the first thing I want to point out is, is Dr. R is right. It's like, we did not see the straight finger movement coming down, and it might just be because their sequence was playing the guitar and they, they didn't have it. I suspect it can, but we haven't seen it, so we don't know for sure. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at this sequence right now, and you can see the thumb is already – is that abducted fully? I think it's, it's already in opposition. Yeah, oh, in it's opposition. already okay. rotated in opposition, waiting for it to just fix. Right, right. Now, what I want you to do is if you can see my – my cursor right down here you see this tendon here um i think it's this one or we're going to notice that one of the tendons okay i think it's actually this tendon down here this has been pulled all the way down so this is in tension that actuator is pulling on this tendon and i believe that's the tendon that is connected to that opposition movement there and now what i want you to see is that the thumb is suddenly moving somewhere else we're not seeing the actuator that's pulling down on that, but you'll notice there's a slight lag and this one goes up. Mm -hmm. So that is relaxing the tension on it, but you'll notice it's not 100% coordinated. It's more or less like the other one starts to pull on it and then you get enough tension and that one finally goes up. So when you look at it really closely, there's a slight delay because they probably want to keep a little bit of tension on it, but it does have to go the opposite way. It if, if it remains stiff, then the two are going to be fighting against each other. So that is basically retracting to allow the tendon on the other side to pull it in the other direction. And, and I've now been able, through my anatomy here, to identify which tendon <laughs> works that degree of freedom. I now have like 21 more to go. If I go back and forth here, I think we can see one of those actuators kind of moving up and down. Yeah. And so from here, we can see that one's going up. And, and we know that's, that's more pushing. And as we push on a tendon, it's, it's, it's compression. It's not going to work very well. So somewhere in the backside, somewhere else that I can't see, there's another one that's going down. Now, if I, if I run this backwards, you know, you can sort of see that as that goes down, it pulls it over. But the sequence is actually, I mean, I can't go backwards. I don't want to go backwards in time. I'm going forwards in time. So what we're actually capturing here is the tendon relaxing to allow it to move in the other direction. Yeah. And then, of course, at this point, I think right there, boy, we get a nice shot on the inside of the hand and all of the tendons that kind of go through. And this is another question I have for you, Dr. Iyer, is that, you know, mechanically we can see what looks like all the actuators over here through these tendon bundles are probably the actuators that are working the opposite side of the hand. Mm -hmm. So these tendons all form an X through the carpal tunnel. And of course, the reason to do that is so the tendons don't get kinked or, or anything like that. We, we want to keep it as straight as possible. 
is the human body kind of doing the same thing also with the, with our tendons? Are our tendons kind of on opposite sides of the forearm for actuation of the fingers? See, in the hand now, there are multiple pulleys which are there. At the wrist level, there's a carpal tunnel, there's an A1 pulley, there's an A2 pulley, A3, A4, A5, then, the, then there's C1, C2, C3. Like this, there are multiple pulleys. These pulleys, basically, they hold the tendons in place. They don't allow it to displace. They improve the power of the hand. The moments, whatever it is there, it, uh, it basically... Uh, uh, it ju just acts like a lever or a pulley and then and the, it increases the power across the fingers. If you don't have these uh, pulleys which are holding the tendons together in the in their place, the power at the finger will be very, very less. Once mm -hmm. these pulleys are there, the power in the fingers becomes increased. And uh, you, you must have seen uh, the mountaineers and all, they're able to hold the entire body weight on, on the fingertips. That is all yeah. because of the pulleys. These pulleys which, which are there, which are very strong and they mm -hmm. hold the tendons together. They actually amplify the power at the tip of the finger. If you individually, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, muscles may not have so much of power, but with the pulleys, the, uh, the power is augmented. Once the uh, power is augmented, you have more force at the, at the distal tip. And okay, so they also help in uh, the the moment uh, regulation also. All right. So it's very clear because, you know, me mechanically, when you're dealing with cables like that, they're going to get routed through something. We can see that they've put like a sheath on there or cover that would be very much like a bicycle cable to protect it at least part of the way. Then at some point, it looks like the cables come out of that. So that's acting as some way to direct it. And also because we have so many cables next to each other, without that sheathing or covering, then all of the lines would just be rubbing against each other and creating a lot of friction and probably starting like a little campfire if, if you do that too much. So you need a little bit of protection. The other thing, of course, when you're looking at the routing, was it's a very clever wrist design that they've come up with that allows that opening for all that stuff to go through. So mechanically, that's also kind of tricky is how do you design something to even allow that to go through without the cables like going in exterior routing. So interior routing is very clever crossing it to make sure the cables don't get bent and everything. We don't know the material they're using. We know in the original one, they said they're metal, which probably meant stainless steel or something like that. On the new ones, I suspect they're using some sort of synthetic, like um, you know, either an Aramid like, like Kevlar or, or Vectran, which um, are very smooth. So, so the, it, it's, it's very nice on the way they roll it in. But the other thing is that they don't stretch. So, um, this is generally a problem with like a lot of these mechanical hands that people try putting them in there is that after a while, the tendons start to stretch and stretch and stretch and suddenly everything gets out of alignment and your range of motion gets sacrificed because now it's, it's getting undone. And I mean, I don't have to tell you, but you know, it's like, as you, you know what it's like to try to repair a human hand. Yeah. <laughs> the surgery to go in there when a tendon is in the wrong way and kind of going around like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be the same nightmare with a mechanical one, which you have to re repair that one tendon, opening it up and doing everything else. So service could be a nightmare. So you, you've got to try to build these things. The other thing, and I'm sure this is what you tell all your patients after, is it's like, when you type, don't type like that. You're going to get metacarpal syndrome. Keep your finger, your hand straight, because the more you do that, the, the more you're kind of compromising and making it harder for those tendons going through there, that you want to have good posture, you want to use everything right, and you only kind of use this occasionally because it allows you to do something, but you don't actually want to always be operating like that. So like mountain climbers don't go up the mountain like that. They get <laughs> the wrists are straight. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So from a prosthetics point of view and from your experience, is there any crossover? I mean, if you were to advise the Tesla engineering team on, on material science and what to use best, because as, as uh, Scott just pointed out, the amount of friction that you have to take into account, the amount of wear and tear, you need longevity, you need strength, you need the ability to flex. Um, from a material science perspective, do you think there's anything you could advise in terms of um, you know, what, what components could be made of? Uh, what we see is whenever we advise them and motorize processes, most of the people, one is they are concerned about the whether they can use with water. Right. When the hand becomes wet or when it gets dirty, uh, how, how dirty can it become? So it should be dust proof and waterproof. 
for anything to be worthwhile uh, for a person to use more uh, roughly okay mm -hmm. but these are delicate uh, means very fine objects so they require to be more durable durability is one thing waterproofing yeah. is one thing and uh, other thing is requirement for charging the batteries they all require power source for them to work so the the battery should be waterproof or it should be cased in such a way that it's, it's waterproof because most of these people who wear these processes they also have sweating mm -hmm. they sweat a lot so this uh, this sweat acts acts like an electrolyte electrolyte uh, and it also corrodes the whatever electronic equipment whichever is there so that's one other thing the other thing is the sensors which they put on the muscles for having the biofeedback from the from the muscles so that the activation happens okay so those are areas where yes we require to improve so that the patients are more comfortable one is where all they have to put the sensors that is one thing battery should be waterproof dust proof and uh, lightweight they should be lightweight if it's very heavy again people have difficulty in holding it for a longer time that's not your own hand yeah yeah uh, th 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 those are all very very good points in that you know <laughs> just having dealt with like the the flooding from helene and yeah, I, I know what salt water does to stuff and like it corrodes things really quickly. And basically that's what sweat is. So, so that's the first thing you have to do, let alone the fact that you might be exposing it to other, you know, dust and everything else. And we can see if, if we look just closely at this hand again. Yeah, right there. This thing is not dust proof. Okay. The, the, the IP rating of this thing is like probably zero, zero. Um, you've got pinch points in here. That you'd have to be careful of dust water so they are going to need some sort of covering around there absolutely yeah. otherwise it's going to get in there the the other thing of course is that um we haven't seen the whole forearm but we know it's just packed with actuators and, and we've only seen what i think is the top ring and so if i'm right now there's probably like 22 or you know 21 or 22 actuators so there might be like three rings of seven of these things are going there and then we also have the actuators which make the uh, the the wrist movement on there. That's a lot of bulk they have to move around. So the actuators they have must be very, very light and compact to be able to do it because now you have a lot of mass out here and all that mass out there means that shoulder is having to work really hard. So it becomes its own kind of payload to deal with. So again, you bring up a very good point. It has to be lightweight. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard on the rest of the mechanism moving these things around we need to make sure it's durable. And at the same time, these robots are supposed to work in factories. The factories, they, they have dust. They have fluids. They got all this other stuff. You know, if we want to work in a restaurant, well, you know, <laughs> kitchens, you get stuff all over the place. So that's, that's the challenge. How you make something which can have that kind of flexibility and then also make sure it's protected. And, you know, I assume it's just going to be some sort of disposable... <laughs> Kind of latex, not so much a glove, but something similar to a glove that will be durable enough for a couple of shifts. And then that might just be a consumable that you, you constantly have to change. And is that the same thing with prosthetic hands? Is there constantly some sort of consumable part of it that must be replaced? In prosthetic hands, one is color. They want a good color match. The color mm -hmm. fades off. Battery, if it's a motorized one, battery is another thing. Sometimes the cables which they have for movement, they break off. They require servicing, lubrication. So uh, means everything takes a toll. Do you yes. have to get it serviced at um, a reasonable period of time? Frequency is there where you have to get it serviced or get it repaired, refurbished, so that it, it's continuously in use. Okay. And many people, uh, and most of the patients who have an amputation, in our setup, they are not able to afford the advanced ones. They are going to go for the basic ones. That's the most common thing which is there. And those who opt for the basic ones also with little movement or little little motorized movement, they also face the problem of the battery, electrodes, and water. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I assume there's like two levels of maintenance. There, there's the one where you have to go into a shop and someone's going to professionally kind of work on it. And the other might be like the daily maintenance. 
So is it daily maintenance? It's probably pretty light. And I'm assuming, I mean, there's going to be every, everything of, of just, you know, making sure it's, it, it's clean and everything. Uh, if you have to replace a battery, and again, you talk about like lubrication, is that something that they're able to do or is that something that has to be professionally done? Lubrication, I don't think as uh, user, user service, serviceable uh, lubrication is not there, I think so. Most, okay. most of it is at the, at the workshop and they don't do any lubrication at, at home. They basically okay. uh, see whether it's working or not, battery charging, battery capacity, how much is it? That's the main concern for them. And mm -hmm. the other concern is about basically they can they can't touch water with that. And uh, the other thing is if it is a bilateral amputee, it becomes more difficult because they have to wear it also. Yeah. Okay, somebody yeah. has to wear. So the other thing which is important is easy wearability. Mm -hmm. If you can just put your hand in a socket, it, it gets fitted in, into your hand. That's best best case scenario. It's really like a just get stuck. Inside. Almost like a glove, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, That's interesting. Wrap it somewhere and uh, keep it fixed to the hand. That's another uh, problem. Very quickly, do you do you looking at the design evolution of the of the Optimus hand? Do you feel that there is scope or potential, maybe in the next five to ten years as it evolves, for it to turn into a bionic hand that can be used um, for humans, your amputees? I sincerely feel that, that, that that's the future ahead because many of the functions of a patient who is having a mutilated hand cannot be replic replicated by just doing a reconstruction. Now, uh, trans hand transplants have come into being where you are able to get a hand which is functional, which is sensitive and useful. But again, yeah. there's a limitation for the time period with for which you are able to use that uh, transplanted hand. The transplanted hand usually survives for 10 to 15 years. And beyond that, it gets rejected by the body. Because right. over a period of time, the, the ha whichever tissue which you put, if it's not yours, it gets rejected. Yeah. yeah. And rejection is, a uh, if it's not an acute rejection, it's a chronic rejection. And in mm -hmm. chronic rejection, what happens is blood supply to the hand gets compromised over a period of time. And if they don't take the medicines properly for a, a transplanted hand, then it can get rejected fast. Yeah, so, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So you think there is a, a very real potential? Yes. How much do you think? How do, how many how many evolutionary steps do you feel um, Tesla has to go through to get in a more advanced hand that is almost or let's say 90 90 percent um functionality of the natural human hand see most of the patients are happy with some function mm. because everybody cannot afford a, a very good processes some function is better than no function that is the first basic uh, second is they want to look good they want to look natural so they want to have hand which appears natural they don't want a hand which looks metallic a metallic hand they don't like they want a hand which looks natural so that they can go in the society without uh, getting observed or looked at looked at mm. then whatever hand which they get mm, uh, affordability is one thing affordability availability uh, and uh, serviceability if right. you get a hand if you if you, if you can aff afford a hand it should be uh, uh, if it gets a problem, you should be able to service it. If you are yeah. not able to yeah. service it, it becomes again useless. Yeah. yeah. Then affordability, everybody cannot afford it. So affordability is a major criteria. And usefulness, how much useful yeah. it is going to make make their lives? Are they able to do yeah. a typing? Are they able to do writing? Are they able to ride a bike? Are they able to drive a car? Are are they able to hold a stick? An umbrella like that the daily uses that should suffice if it suffices yeah. that then they are very well very very happy yeah but for a first gen for a first gen hand that could be used as a prosthetic fine motor movement would not really be no they don't essential. require that they don't require they require something to happen in the hand they're happy with mm -hmm. that once they get the basic requirement done then then they may aspire for more mm -hmm. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. fascinating, Scott, because I don't think we've really considered this use case for the Tesla ad yet. Well, it, uh, Elon has. I think others. You know, he he has talked about that. Uh, eventually, these could be used as prosthetics, and the question is how that fits in with Neuralink because it's one thing to have the hand. The other thing yeah. is like, how do you command the hand to do what you want? Are you able right. to tap in directly to nerve endings? And my understanding is that a lot of prosthetic hands are using sort of something with like muscle twitching and measuring that. And the individual basically reprograms or remaps in their head exactly what the function of the hand, which, which is already amazing that the, that, that the human brain is able to sort of remap yeah. those things pretty quickly yeah. with a little bit of training. So that's going to be part of the interface. And the other thing is like, depending upon the, the level of, of amputation that you have is that there's this hand has got a lot of stuff going on down to here, which, which means it would almost be like a below elbow kind of amputation to get that full functionality. It doesn't mean there couldn't be some way of being able to make it more compact that you could have that functionality move, migrate maybe more back into the palm and still allow you to to maintain um, the rest of your anatomy down there. So there's going to be challenges. However, what's happened in robotics right now is a revolution in actuators. Um, you know, we, we know how to, we know how to make motors for like well over a century and, and real big motors and stuff like that. And then we figured out how to put them in the cars and we had some small little actuators here and there, but we didn't really have the ones that have the power density we want and the capabilities. And right now I think everyone's thinking about that right down to some kind of artificial muscle. So the question is, is an artificial muscle going to just be like a really cool, somehow compact motor that's very efficient, that kind of fits in there. Or is there going to be, again, some kind of biomimicry there where you find a material that when you apply some sort of voltage along it, either, you know, it kind of contracts to create a little tension on the. I, I don't know what it's going to be. All I know is like I'm on the sidelines here just cheering on every single group that is is going after that, because yeah. when you get that, then it, it opens up a possibility, not just that we're going to have these robots that are going to be very Android like, but the prosthetics we're going to have are going to be amazing. And that is going to help a lot of people a lot more. So what I really, part of the reason I'm excited about the humanoid bots is that they're going to do work that no one really wants to do. And people really shouldn't have to do it because a lot of it is tedious and difficult and dangerous. But at the same time, it's also going to bring quality of life to people who don't have it two ways. One, you know, someone needs a, uh, a humanoid bot in their house to help them with a lot of stuff that they can't do because of, of aging. And the other is they may have lost a functionality and now we can give it back to them. So there's, I, th I think the design that's going on here is good. And hopefully there's more collaboration between um, prosthetic design sur and, and surgeons and doctors and the robots are good. Cause like I say right now, they're all being designed by engineers and I, I'm not even <laughs> sure there's a biomechanist in the room and, and maybe they need to consult a little bit more. Absolutely. What do you think, Dr. Ayer? I feel that yes, in the future and even the current uh, position uh, means these prosthetic hands which are motorized, they are going to change the lives of patients quite a, quite significantly. With miniaturization of the motor, motors, it is going to make it possible to accommodate a lot of actuators which are which you have smaller actuators which can perform better function miniaturization miniaturization of the bat uh, means the power requirement the power requirement also is miniaturized or it's reduced so the battery life will be higher and now the battery capacity also is going to get increased uh, with the lighter batteries and with more capacity that would be there plus they can also be powered by uh, solar power or any other power, body heat or some some power so that additional uh, uh, electricity requirement is less. Mm. So the future is great, actually. I, I think there's a big potential for these and there's a big market for all, all these things. Uh, as the requirement and the uh, market and the, uh, both the demand and the supply, they have to be matched. So yeah. the, it will take some time, but over a period of time, yes, once it goes into mass production, then it will become much, much cheaper for the consumer. Yes. yes. And what is your view about the synergy and the potential of use case for when you have Neuralink 
uh, and the Tesla robotics teams with the Optimus and etc. come together to provide uh, replacement prosthetics for humans. How transformative is that? I think it's going to be a big revolutionary transformation. If you are able to think and move, that's the best thing, best case scenario. If you just think and the moment happens, that's the best case scenario. And mm -hmm. of course, the, the, you should also think about the paraplegics and the quadriplegics having an exoskeleton to make them move. Uh, that's a big, big thing which can happen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Either with like um, people who have got tremors, they are having shaking. They don't have coordination. If something which happens, which you can just think and the hand moves in a coordinated manner, mm -hmm. or the patient moves in a coordinated manner, it's a big thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And if they're sort of thinking of, of dual purpose of this technology is that right now you could be designing this thing. It's just going to be a robotic cam, but you're, you're also sort of thinking about the other ways like, Oh, just with a minor thing, we can go ahead and do that. Now you get the scale because in some ways, I guess, you know, it's kind of fortunate. There's not like a huge market for prosthetics. It's not like we want a huge market for that, but that's yeah. also a problem is because you don't have this huge market. It's very costly to build, build these things. And we know with everything that when you start to get scale, and, yeah. and producing a lot of them, the costs go down. So if these things are kind of together, that means suddenly the cost goes down, which means the availability goes up, the capability goes up, and all those things that Dr. I was kind of pointing out that the problems today with the prosthetics is like it really comes down to affordability. We're going to be able to solve that problem. And now we're talking about improving the quality of life for like you know millions of people um, across the board because now you have that capability. The other thing is that you know serviceability – it can be a problem because for a lot of people, they may live in like a, a distant village and great, they get fitted, but every time they get a service, they get a long trip to go into the big city to get that thing fixed. When you start having these Tesla bots or, or humanoids that are available everywhere else, the chances are a place that's able to provide the service and the maintenance on it is going to be a lot closer. So again, the more you do that, the, the way it makes everything easier and everyone's quality of life is going to improve a lot. Absolutely. The one thing which is there is uh, if you have these Tesla bots which are coming out, which can be programmed, means the knowledge can be transferred to them at, a, at an instant and they can become doctors, engineers or any mm -hmm. mechanic, anything they can change in anything. You don't require to yeah. just uh, uh, pre-program it at the time. You can just transfer the transit when, as and when required and they can do it. And AI anyhow is coming up in a big way. So many other things will be become aut automated also. Yeah. Depending upon it, it may it may think I require to do a plumbing. So it just recognizes, it just downloads what the plumbing is required and just does the plumbing work. If it, if it sees yeah. an electrical problem is there, it just downloads an electrician uh, and then becomes an electrician and does something like that. Yeah, but and that's it. That's right. But but also think of this template of like, if you get a prosthetic that suddenly has a lot of built-in functionality, I mean, it's always been my dream that one day I just like pick up a guitar and I can play it like Jeff Beck. And the other thing is cooking. Cooking. If, if you want some, yeah. something yes. to be cooked, the yeah. recipe can be pushed inside his brain and he yeah. just cooks it for I mean, you. It, but it could, it'd be kind of weird if you just like have that prosthetic hand and you pick it up and suddenly <laughs> it's just going through and everything and you're not even thinking about it. It just does it right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, wow. We're living, we're living in fascinating times. Okay, so um, what's your expert view, Dr. Ayer? How much more does the Tesla ha Optimus hand need to evolve? Is it? Do you think it's kind of it's done seventy percent? It's gone seventy percent of the way as far as how how far it can come in its evolutionary process. Where would you rank it right now, as it as you see it? See, the basic hand has come up. The basic movements of the hand has come up, but the finacy of the movement will take time and effort. And uh, there's a lot long, long way to go for that. I don't say it's a short way. It's a long way because mm -hmm. there's no thing that this, this much is enough. There's no uh, limit for True. improvement. Right. So the improvement yeah. limit is not that at all. You mm -hmm. can keep on improving yourself. Yeah. But from a bio fun biomechanical functional point of view, how much have they already achieved? I think 80%, 80, 90% they have improved quite a bit. Wow. Okay. For the basic function. See, a person who doesn't have anything, for him, it's a big thing for to have to do something with, with his hand. Right. Or to do anything, you know. For him, he may be like 
over the moon okay for getting some function okay for him what he, he doesn't have the hand for him you just think you are able to do something it's a big thing because our brain adapts to even the small moment it will it will do trick moments and do the achieve what you want it's not only the hand should function completely he, if the hand is not moving he'll move his shoulder and move it he'll do it yeah he'll do the trick moments and try to achieve mm-hmm. or if the hand is not moving forward he will move himself forward and do it so he'll yeah. adapt to it that human ad- adaptation also is a big thing you know uh, yeah. sometimes we think this moment is not may not be a big use but uh, when you see the person actually doing he may be do- doing much more than what you what you intended to, to, to do and and that, that's the other thing is we we are pretty good that whenever we have something that can become an extension of our bodies. So in a sense, as, as soon as you pick up a bottle, it almost becomes like a prosthetic that, that I know where the end of this thing is, you know, whether it's a pain or something like that. I mean, you, you kind of get the feel of going, it's, it's amazing how your body will see that. And I, I've done this trick all the time. You know, I can close my eyes and touch my nose of this thing because I've got this visual model of where it is. So we were very good of adapting with these different mechanics that are on there. I kind of agree with, with, with Dr. Iyer that like the hand movement is is very close to where it needs to be. The one thing they haven't done yet, which I wish they would, that you know, one of the compromises that they did again on the first hand, that's still there with the second hand, is all the fingers are the same length. <laughs> and you may not notice it, but because they made a little bit of an offset, but it's really clear because the pinky is way up there. Now this is a prototype they're working on. I, I suspect when they're done, they're going to make sure the fingers are like sort of similar lengths that you would have for a 50th percentile uh, on there. So it looks like they have all the movements. There'll be some people that might say, oh, there's still some movements you got in the palm. That you're gonna, it's like, okay, look, we can only go so far there. But the fine movements is, is going to be interesting. And the question is, is that a mechanical problem or is that just going to be like a training problem with the AI? Because you are dealing with tendons. Tendons are just finicky beasts. There's a lot of calibration that, you know, you'll put it all the identical tendons in the hands and both hands will behave differently because there's just no way to make them identical. They're going to change over time with temperature and usage and everything else. So you need something to be able to adapt to that. And will you really be able to get that very fine light touch in there? And of course, the sensors, you know, we need yeah. pressure sensors. We need some sort of tactile sensors. Do we need temperature? You know, what what are the sensors that we need to have to make sure that it really works both robotically? And then a question I was like, how do you take sensor information from a prosthetic and get that back to the human? You know, it's like, yeah. is, is, is there some way that when I touch something, it will feel sharp to me if it's a prosthetic? You know, we, we would like maybe the humanoid bot to be able to do that. But remember, not just a little sensor pad have on our fingers. It's like all over the place. I mean, you poke me with a with a, a pin anywhere on there, I'm going to feel it. But with the Optimus spot, you know, around there, you can put a latex cover on there. It's not going to feel anything. So are you going to have sophisticated sensors that are somehow built in these covers in the future? Right now, I'm not sure you need that. What you can have is a specs-like thing, which is got a camera, which is, which is seeing that. And the AI, whatever is there, it's analyzing the situation accordingly ordering to do what 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 movements are required to perform the function because every function cannot be simulated by your muscles because you have yeah. limited amount of muscles above and the mm-hmm. nerve nerve signals cannot be transmitted to the hand yes the bionic hand cannot get the nerve simulation ner- nerve simulation and the whatever biofeedback you get from the gross muscles may not be adequate for the full function of the hand it's, so it, that requires an, I think it requires an AI technology where mm-hmm. it can anticipate what you want to do and perform the function for you. Yes. hundred percent agree that the, it's, Something it's nice. which you can wear on your head or on the specs where it can identify what, what is a problem to be done and then help you do it. Right. Or right. it can be a voice assistant. You want to say, I want to pick up the uh, pick up the uh, teapot, or I want to pick up the glass of water. Just say, pick the glass of water. So your hand goes and you pick it up. Right, and and but you you're right. You need the camera. So from the standpoint of the humanoid bot, mm-hmm. it seems the vision system is a very important part of the movement of the hands, and that it, it may be that that's all it needs because it's just going to keep on going to its goal until its goal looks right. And if it's not right, it's going to make those subtle adjustments. And the thing is, 
whatever those subtle adjustments are, probably the next time you run that, like, you know, a week later, it's completely different inputs because things have drifted and get a little bit different. But the main thing is the vision input. So you would take something like that, like you say, make some kind of goggles or, you know, um, almost like Meta has those glasses. That might be sufficient that from it, when you are driving that thing, saying what you want to do, the AI is able to look at that and do that fine tuning. You can have a voice assistance. You may say, I want to do this. So mm -hmm. it helps it decide what it what it wants to do. Yes. You say, I want to repair this wire or I want to pick up this glass. I want to open this book. So you move the hand accordingly and it, it helps you move it. Mm -hmm. Or oh, you could mm -hmm. think it because yes, through Neuralink, yes. yeah, you eventually. could just think it. Yeah, yes, you give a suggestion. You give a suggestion yeah. by voice, voice enabled suggestion to it so that mm -hmm. it understands what you want to do and performs mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, and but but it's also going to need that vision feedback to kind of see yeah, it. Visual so feedback it, will be there, but it, let's it might, uh, add yeah. it, one it more. Have some, it'll it'll have some built-in proprioception, but we're not sure how accurate that proprioception is going to be. You know, with industrial robots, they're very accurate because they put encoders in all the joints and everything is so stiff and stuff like that. When you start dealing with tendons, I don't think they're going to put like little protractors or, or encoders in every single joint there to measure that. That's just asking too much. And every time you put a sensor, you need wires, you need all this other stuff. So the, so you want another way that simplifies it. And part of it's going to be the force sensor to get that. But in the end, it's going to be, does it look right? It could be just like a program. It could be just like a program, a sequence mm -hmm. of events, which mm -hmm. are timed and programmed. So if you want to pick up a glass, this is the moment which is going to happen. So it will move exactly and pick it up. Take a minute. Mm -hmm. So in that way, yes. And of course, your brain will adjust to the moments of it and, and adjust your arm accordingly to pick it up. And that's basically muscle memory. Is that there's yeah. so many things we do that our brain really doesn't do. It's just like it just happens because we gave the command to grasp. We're not thinking about closing our hands. It, it seems to be a more localized thing. So, yeah. so basically, we're duplicating <laughs> the yeah. way the human body works, anyways. Yeah, wonderful. So, gentlemen, it's been such a such a pleasure and so enlightening to uh, yeah. hear all your insights, Doctor Ayer. This is your first time on on Over yeah. the Horizon. It's been absolutely fantastic having you and listening Thank to everything that you've shared with us. And I, I hope. We'll have you come back and uh, join Sport and me as we follow the evolution, the fascinating evolution of the Tesla Optimus robot. But thank you so much for your time. Yeah, some Thanks. great insights. Thank you, Doctor. I was it was a pleasure thank meeting you, and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit smarter as a result. So thank you very much. No, it's good to good to be on the program, and I, I got to meet you both, Scott and Bissosa. Yeah, and a shout out to, to my classmate, Dr. Siddharth, yes. who helped me get yes. uh, Dr. And, Ayer on the show. So thank and you, say, Siddharth. And You're say welcome. hello to Bangalore for me. It was like, uh, yeah. I've been to India once, and that was one of the towns that I visited. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. All right. Thank you.